chat in the room so what is the largest core that you you obtained so far in the inventory problem do you have any question any question no no so i think uh, no question here okay no question on the chat so we can uh, we can go Okay, second part is uh, it's going to be about dynamic programming, and uh, I will try to go relatively quick on this because I, I, I really want us to spend a little bit more time on the second uh, uh, half on the properly set reinforcement learning algorithms. So, uh, so far what we have seen is uh, how the environment interacts with the agent, uh, so what is the MDP, what is the policy, how we evaluate the quality of the policy, and we start with basically the definition of the objective that you want to solve. So, uh, if we look at this optimization problem, even if we fix one specific state of reference, let's say S0, uh, you know, we just care about optimizing the policy there. Um, unfortunately, if we try to open up a little bit this optimization problem, it looks like it's, it's going to be very complicated. So let's first just recall what is the search space. So the policy pie, we said that we focus on things that map states to actions. So it means that for each, let's let's assume that you know states and action spaces are uh, finite, uh, so discrete and finite, and uh, then the, the space of possible policies, so objects of this kind, its cardinality is equal to a actions per state, so it's a to the s, right, or the cardinality of a. So first, bad news is that this is a combinatorial set. That's, that's the first news that definitely doesn't make this look very easy to manage. The second uh, ingredient here is that, so what we want to maximize is this objective function, but this objective function contains an infinite number of terms. Of course, that they get discounted over time, but it's still an infinite number of them. And additionally, as soon as we, you know, uh, we look into it, this S0, S1, S2 evolution depends on our pi, and it's also stochastic. And so what we care about is maximizing this expectation. So this is a you know, stochastic optimization problem over a combinatorial set uh, where the objective function is made of an infinite number of terms. So this doesn't definitely look we are promising for optimization. You know, it's not one of those things that you might have seen during the previous courses where you know we have f of x, f of x is convex with respect to s, so strongly convex, we do some, I don't know, some gradient descent on it and we are done. So this looks very complicated, but the true question is, is it really that complicated and can we somehow reveal some underlying structure of the problem that uh, makes it intrinsically easier? And the answer, fortunately, is yes. There is a lot of structure into this. And maybe, you know, before we diving into the actual equations, I will just provide a little bit of intuition. So imagine that I have an MDP, which is uh, deterministic. Uh, so deterministic means that, uh, you know, whenever I'm in a, a state uh, S T equal S, and I perform an action at T equal A. So the probability to get to a specific S prime is either zero or one, right? So I have a deterministic transition. Okay, which means that if I start from this state and I take this action, there is always a specific next state. Okay, so we'll call this as zero, let's say this is a zero, as one, and I have a one, oh, sorry, a one, this is as two, a two, as three. And let me stop here and then you know, just dot, dot, dot for the infinite sequence. 
to associate it to each uh, of these transitions, we also have a reward. So rewards usually are, are, are indexed by the arrival state. So that's the reason why I'm calling this R1 and not R0. But you know, it's just a convention. It depends also on the textbook that you look at. And then there will be an R4 and so on and so forth. Uh, so what we said is that what we would like is to maximize R1 plus gamma R2 plus gamma square R3 plus gamma cube R4 and so on and so forth. We would like to find a sequence of actions that maximizes this. Okay, the first thing that we're going to do now is to actually just study for a specific policy what is going to be its performance. And so I have this cumulative sum of these kind of rewards. I have an infinite number of them. But since it's fortunately the transitions are deterministic, I don't need to put an expectation here. So whenever I will be executing the policy, specific policy pi in starting in a zero, I will always be obtaining this sequence of rewards because the only source of randomness in the environment is the transitions. And so now I'm, I'm removing it. But still, you know, even just computing this sum, it's complicated because I have an infinite number of terms. So let's start to see whether we can simplify a little bit this or, or somehow reveal an underlying structure of this. So just to be a little bit more explicit, let me call this R0 of the policy that I execute in a zero, plus gamma this is the reward that I observe. S1, the policy that executes in S1, L squared, R of S2, by of S2, plus so on and so forth, right? Okay. So now let me ask a simple question, which is can you tell me what is the value function of S1? Okay, so let's follow the definition. The, value function in S1 is the sum of rewards that I will be obtained by starting from S1 and following policy pi. Okay, let's move back here. So it's going to be R of S1 associated to the policy that I execute there, plus gamma, R of S2, the policy that I execute there, plus gamma squared, R of S3, pi S3, uh, plus uh, stuff. Okay, now wait a minute here. So we already noticed that there is a very, very strong connection between the value function that I can get in, at one state and the value function that I get in another state. Because now if you just you know observe what I'm writing here and what I'm writing here is exactly the same thing. It's the infinite sum of discounted rewards from S1 and it's this infinite sum of rewards from S1. So by just you know, pairing the two equations, you can easily see that this one is what? It's R of S0, pi of S0, plus gamma. Here I'm grouping one gamma from the rest. And then I have this plus gamma this plus gamma squared this. So basically what I'm having is just this sequence of rewards which is by definition is exactly v pi of s1, right? So here I'm, I'm kind of revealing a deep connection between the value function that I can get at different states because of course, since the value function is the sum of the rewards that I can get from this moment on, well, if I reach some states, then I will get as much reward as the value function at those states. And so uh, I cannot you know, obtain uh, any value from a zero and any value in S1, because the difference between the value that I can uh, get from these two subsequent states is really just the reward that is missing in between and a discounting factor gamma. So this is a fundamental observation uh, in, uh, in uh, dynamic programming and MDP theory, which goes under the, the name of the uh, Bellman equation. So this is now in the general case of, uh, uh, 
of, um, of stochastic MDPs or general cases of, of MDPs. And you see that it has exactly this structure. The value function in a state is the immediate reward plus gamma. And then this one, let me just rewrite it a bit different. This is just the expected value with respect to the next state of v pi of y, where y is drawn from the transition of the MDP STA. Oh, sorry, where a here is pi of s. Okay, so what I'm saying is that there are infinite sum of rewards that I can get starting from s and follow is pi is the first reward plus gamma, the value of the states that I can achieve, weighted by the probability with which I achieve them. So basically, this is just you know explicit form for this expectation. Because in turn, the value function of the state that I achieve is the infinite sum of rewards that I will be able to get from there on up to a discount factor gamma again. So this is a very compact and concise way to express something which was very complicated that we started from. So we started from something that had an expectation over an infinite sum of things. And this is a very complicated object. And this looks now much more compact and, 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 and also informative somehow. It really reveals the dynamics of the MDP and the connections that transitions happen from states to other states through the actions that I, I choose uh, in the policy. So let's just try to um, you know, uh, browse through this idea uh, through an example. Uh, so this example is, is, as I call it, the student dilemma. So you have you know, these uh, smiley faces or less smiley faces, which are the states. They can be in this state, this state, this state, and so on and so forth. And uh, the mm, bolder arrows are actions. And uh, so for instance, I usually have two actions, either rest or work. And then the thinner arrows are the actual transitions. But as we know by now, the transitions can be uh, uh, um, you know, uh, stochastic. And so there is, uh, on the top of the arrow, this is the probability with which this transition might happen. So this probability is 0 0.5, I stay in this state. Probability 0 0.5, I move to this state. And finally, this is the reward associated to the very uh, same state. So I will be using, out of this you know, general formulation of reward, I will be using the much easier one, where the reward that you obtain is the one of the state you start from. So if I take an action starting from this state, I get an immediate reward of zero, and then you know, transitions and so on and so forth. So the global sort of you know, very loose interpretation of this game is, is the fact that you know if you if you're in a start with a normal neutral state and you rest, rest can be you know, have fun, play, do whatever you like. You're happier, but if you rest too much, then you fail your exams and you get a minus ten. So bad, bad choice. But if you do a careful mixture of resting and working and resting and working, then you know you might get intermediate bad uh, rewards because you get more tired and then you know, not as happy. But eventually, if you, you know, for instance, you prepare very well for the exam and then you get a good rest, then you succeed your exam and you get a reward of 100. But if you work too much, you work, 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 then you, know, you just uh, have a burnout and uh, minus 1,000 is the reward that you get in this case. Okay, so now uh, I propose a policy here, and what we would like to understand is what is the expected cumulative sum of rewards that I can obtain by following this policy. So let's consider this policy, for instance. The policy that says in, when I'm here, I take a rest, when I'm here, I work. When I'm here, I take a rest. And when I'm here, I work. Of course, again, the transitions are not deterministic. So it doesn't mean that if I rest, I will automatically be happy. I might just stay a little bit neutral as much as 
Whereas if I'm here and I work, it doesn't necessarily you know, end up in this state. I might just uh, uh, you know, stay here with probability 0.5. So again, if I just wanted to use the original value function definition, so this one, and you ask me, can you compute the value function in this problem? I would really have a hard time. It's, it's very complicated. I would need to I'll compute the expected value over infinitely, or well, in this case anyway, you know, the, eventually I reach a terminal state, so it might not be infinite, but anyway, over stochastic trajectories of variable length, and then evaluate what is its, the probability associated to it, sum up, or, it, it's complicated. In short, it's complicated. But now we would like to use the Bellman equation to simplify this job. And it turns out that it's very easy. So let's give just an example. Let's start from this state. Okay, this state is very peculiar because basically once I reach this state, there's no action that I can take, and so there's no dynamics, there's no future reward that I can get. All I can get is just the reward of 100 of this specific state, and so I say that the value function of this is 100. Okay, so this was easy, uh, piece of cake. But then let's try to evaluate the value of this state before. Okay, so uh, by Bellman equation, so let me just rewrite here the, what the Bellman equation says. I have the reward associated to this state, we said that we use the sim simplified version, plus gamma, but in this case, you know, since I will terminate no matter what, and also to simplify the, the math, let's just set it to one. And then I have the sum over next states, probability of reaching that state, action is the one prescribed by the policy, and this will be V pi of the state that I reach. So in this case, when I'm here, and I take the action rest, I have two possible outcomes. With probability dot nine, I end up in six, and so dot nine times the value of the state times uh, v six, and with probability zero dot one, I self loop back in state v four, and so I will be getting v four. So now, if I look at these two equations together, I have two unknowns, which are v six and v four. I have two constraints. V six is a trivial constraint; it takes the value of hundred. I plug it here, and I solve for V4. By solving for V4, what I obtain is roughly 88.8. .8. Okay, so here I run it differently, sorry about that. And okay, so now I know the value of V4. And then I can do the same reasoning for all the other states by just listing up all the uh, equations that, uh, uh, that are coming from the, applying the Bellman equations to the different value functions in different states. So now this is a much easier job with respect to the one of computing the expected sum of rewards, which are, again, this expectation is tricky to compute exactly, and, uh, and the sum of rewards might be very long. But just to make it uh, you know, a little bit more formal, basically what I'm saying is nothing you know, really rocket science. What I'm saying is that, okay, I have a, these, which are the Bellman equations. What I'm saying is that imagine that I have S states, so I have a vector of dimension S. This is another vector of dimension S, because you see that the action part is determined directly by the policy, so this is a function of S, it's a vector of dimension S. And then I have this one, which I can arrange as a matrix where P pi element SY is equal to P of Y even S of pi S. Okay, so I build up this matrix, which has S by S, uh, uh, in, this, in this way. Okay, so now I write it in somehow, you know, more compact uh, matrix notation. So I can rewrite the Bellman equations for all states as V pi equal to R pi, the vector collecting all the components of this, plus gamma matrix P pi applied to the vector V pi. I solve this, and what I get, so already what is this? Now this is a linear system of equations with S unknowns, V pi, and S constraints, which are these equations, one per component. 
So all I have to do is basically just to solve the linear system of equations, I invert on the matrix I minus gamma P pi, and I'm, I, I apply it to R pi, and I obtain the value function. So we took something which was you know, very kind of weird and, and complicated and turned it into a super simple linear system of equations. Of course, what is the complexity of this? Well, you know, it depends on this matrix, but let's say generally it's, it's S cubed in terms of complexity. But what it really matters here is that uh, we uh, greatly simplify the problem. Uh, just a minor technical note, uh, this matrix is always invertible because gamma is strictly smaller than one and P pi is the stochastic matrix. So stochastic matrices have largest eigenvalues. Uh, so the eigenvalues are bounded in zero, one. And, um, and uh, so if I multiply by gamma, I obtain eigenvalues which are smaller than one. And so I minus gamma P is uh, uh, strictly bigger than zero, all the eigenvalues. And so this matrix is, is invertible. But you just to say that yeah, the, the solution always exists. Uh, there's no uh, technical problem with that. So in this problem, basically what I'm saying is that, you know, you just have to you know, take the MDP. We assume now that I know this, these guys here, I plug them into the system of, of equations, I solve it and I'm, and I'm done. I have the value function for all the states and, and I don't need to uh, worry about anything else. Okay, so now, this is, this is a nice, nice part of the story, but let's not forget that our objective is not to evaluate these objects. Our objective is to compute the policy that would maximize, in some sense, the value functions. And just in terms of notation, remember that I will be using V star as the optimal value function associated to, uh, to pi star. Now, it turns out that there is this another type of Bellman equation, which directly characterizes also the optimal value function. So uh, the, the cool stuff here is the fact that even if I don't know what is the optimal policy, I can still characterize a, a, a functional form, a uh, constraint, for the optimal value function. So here I'm not even characterizing what pi star is, but I know that its associated value function will have to satisfy this Bellman equation. What is the difference with respect to the previous one is the fact that now this A is not prescribed explicitly by a policy, but by this quantifier max here. Which, if you think about it, is a relatively trivial, trivial uh, uh, thing to do. So I will come back to this example to illustrate it. So imagine that here I have two choices. I have either A0 or uh, A1. And this is associated to another reward. And then, again, imagine that from the state that I achieve, no matter which one it is, S1 or S prime, an oracle tells me how to act optimally. Okay, so imagine that whatever I do from here or whatever I'm doing over here is the optimal thing, okay? Well, then all I have to do is to take the action, so to discriminate between A0 and A0 prime, which action not only gives me the largest immediate reward, but also leads to the state that has the largest value function, right? So basically, what I'm saying is that if I can choose this, cho this action here to maximize the whole thing here, then I'm good because from this moment on, from the second step on, I will be executing by star. And then this, by maximizing over the first action, it will be the best thing that I can do anyway, right? Because from what I do from this moment on, it's already prescribed by star, it's already known. So the optimal policy will be to take either a zero or a zero prime, which leads to immediate plus future best reward. And this is exactly what is captured in this uh, equation here. If I assume that in the next states, I know what is the optimal value that I can collect, then the optimal value that I can collect from state S is the one that I obtain by executing the action, which is 
greedy, which greedily maximizes this quantity here. This takes a little bit while to you know, digest. It, it might not be you know, super, super clear, but again, it's, it's really just saying, I'm decomposing the competence. I'm saying, if somebody knows how to solve the problem in all states as prime on, then solving the problem in S reduces to just taking the action, which is the best one locally somehow. But again, I want to stress that this is not the action that maximizes the immediate reward, but it's maximizing the immediate reward and the reward that I will be able to collect from that moment on. And there exists another, another nice uh, connection here, which is the fact that the argmax of these is exactly the optimal policy. So this is a super important ingredient because basically it's telling me if somebody was able to compute V star, then a byproduct of that would be to obtain the optimal policy. So this might, might sound super strange in the sense that basically what we said from the beginning is that our objective is to find the optimal policy. Now I'm, and, and then the optimal policy will also be characterized by its own value function. Here I'm reversing a little bit the, the point of view. I'm saying that the optimal value function itself has some properties that might be useful to then derive as a byproduct the optimal policy. So I'm kind of swapping around a little bit the reasoning here. We will see that this interplay between functions and policies is constant in reinforcement learning, and we'll see a lot of algorithms that either play on one or the other or both at the same time. So it's this sort of duality, it's, it's kind of normal in the, the formulations that we have. Is this clear? Uh, let me just you know, pause a second, uh, see whether uh, yeah, there is any question. Uh, things are clear here. Okay, so if no there question. is no question, let's. Okay, thanks. So let's let's try to apply this to this problem again. So previously we used this example just to illustrate how to compute value functions, but what this is promising is that well, I have something very very similar in terms of action value. Sorry, of optimal value functions, and then we could just derive the optimal policy by doing this. So this is very tempting, and so I can do it. It's, it's written here. I have this system of equations. It's very nice. Uh, now, the issue is that it's no longer a linear system of equations because uh, in each of the equations, the first four, for instance, I have a maximum, which means that you know, I cannot really solve this system of equations in any easy way as, as I was doing for the previous one. So the problem is intrinsically more complicated and I have to find alternative solutions to solve it. But at least it's again telling me that there is a lot of structure in the problem and those warnings that I gave at the beginning, working in a combinatorial space, having an infinite number of, 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 of elements and uh, taking that expectations are, have been greatly simplified uh, up to this stage. Now, in order to move to the first algorithm, a practical algorithm, let's say that we are going to see, which is still not a reinforcement learning algorithm, so here we are still in the dynamic programming world, uh, I need to just, you know, to make it more, more readable, I have to introduce an additional function. I'm sorry, it's yet another piece of notation, but this one is uh, it's very important also from an algorithmic point of view. Uh, it's a super minor modification to the previous one. So the previous one was a value function of the state, and we said that it's the expected sum of the rewards of the uh, you know, the rewards observed by executing the policy from time zero to infinity, where the s zero is s. Now this is exactly the same thing, except for the very first step where instead of executing the policy by, we execute the action A prescribed by the left-hand side here by the argument of the function. So the way to read this, which is called state action value function, is start from S, 
take action A, and after that, follow policy pie, and these will be the uh, summer rewards that you can expect. So it's, it's really the same argument with just, you know, the first action that I take is not necessarily the one suggested by pie. So this is the action value function associated to a policy pie. Similarly as before, I can define Q star as the uh, uh, action value function or Q function in short associated to the optimal policy. So the policy that optimizes this one or the policy that optimizes VPI is exactly the same. So that's the reason why it's really a minor change, but it's very convenient. Um, so the reason why it's very convenient, you can already get a glimpse of it uh, through this, this example. So uh, there is a, an operation which usually we say it's to compute the greedy policy with respect to a function V, which is to generate a policy by taking the argmax of this. You say, but wait, we, we have just, you know, we have already seen this. Well, it's slightly different. So what we have seen before was that pi star was the argmax of R of S A plus, oops, sorry. Plus gamma p s prime minus a of v star s prime. So this was in the slide of the Bellman equation. We are saying that the optimal policy is this, and according to this terminology, we can say that pi star, the optimal policy, is greedy with respect to the optimal value function v star. But just for the sake of definition, I can generalize this and say that this is greedy, because it still takes an argmax with respect to another function v. Doesn't necessarily need to be v star. And of course, if v is not v star, well, then this is not by star, right? So it's, it's just a greedy policy. Now, uh, alternatively, I can say that the policy is greedy with respect to an action value function by just taking in state S the action A, which maximizes Q. So this is a much more convenient expression because it doesn't need to compute this expected value of the next state, blah, blah, blah. Basically, the whole thing here is already summarized in the action value function. And then these are max, it's kind of easier to compute. And again, we will see it in practice that this is very important to make the, our algorithms more, uh, uh, more convenient. And again, from Bellman optimality equations, as I said, just, just up here, pi star, we can say that it's greedy with respect to V star, or alternatively, we can say that it's greedy with respect to Q star. Very last slide of notation, I promise. Uh, of course, action value functions and value functions are intimately connected, and also action value functions satisfy Bellman-like equations. So you remember that we had the Bellman equation for V was something like this, plus gamma, and here let me just put for sure the expected value of V pi of S prime. Uh, the action value function satisfies something of this form, and additionally, V pi is the expected community sum of rewards starting from S and executing pi, which is exactly equal to the action value function when the first action is indeed the one suggested by pi, right? So in this case, there's no difference whatsoever between the two functions. So if we replace this into here, then I have Q pi of S prime pi S prime, and so you see that now this is really a Bellman equation for Q, right? I have Q values on the left, Q values on the right, so I have again a Bellman-like equation here. Uh, same for the optimal value function. Uh, I have you know, the same connection as before uh, uh, that you know, connects Q star to the V star of the next thing but the V star of the next thing, it can be expressed as well as the Q star of a specific action, which is the optimal one. It takes a little bit while to digest all these equations. I don't expect you to you know, 
remember all of these things. I will just recall, you know, the important ingredients as we as we move forward. Okay, let's uh, you know give a quick overview of the two algorithms, the only two algorithms that we are going to see about dynamic programming. The reason why I spend time on those, uh, and you would say, okay, but these are L, so why why we are looking at this, is that it makes so much easier to understand the reinforcement learning algorithms after you have seen these two algorithms, because RL will just be a sort of data-dependent, sample-based adaptation of these two algorithms, in most of the cases, at least. Okay, so the first one is called value iteration, and, uh, and it reads like this. Um, so first, what are the assumptions here? So the assumption is that we know everything about the MDP. So we know the reward function, and we know the transition model. So these are inputs of the algorithm. These are known. Strong assumption, we don't want to use this in reinforcement learning, we are gonna remove it. But you know, if I knew them, what would I do? The answer is that I could use this algorithm, which uh, it's basically just one uh, for loop repeated in, uh, across multiple iterations. So let's, let's say that here I have iterations, this k is the index of the iteration, and in each iteration, what I do is to loop over all state actions. I start with the q value, which is, let's say, initialized to zero, but this can be arbitrary. So it doesn't need to be zero, it's just for convenience. And then what I do is to update my q value by, in each state and action, uh, uh, taking this value. Okay, so now uh, what I'm doing here, uh, if you, you know, keep in mind what the optimal Bellman equation looks like, and let me you know, just write it right here on the top, for the action value function, the optimal Bellman equation is uh, uh, basically maximum over prime, Q star S prime A prime. So we said that this uh, constitutes a system of equations, but non-linear system of equations, so it's, it's complicated. Here, what we are doing is just to find uh, the value function Q star, the actual value function Q star that satisfied this equation by just iterating over so how Bellman equations, right? I start from Q0, I compute this whole thing, and I call it Q1. And then I take Q1, I put it on here, I compute this whole thing, and I call it Q2. And then I keep you know, just feeding back the previous iteration in the Bellman equation, let's say, and using the output as the new iteration uh, value function. Uh, now, it turns out that this algorithm here is convergent, uh, and it does converge to Q star. So it's basically just, uh, if you, if this kind of somehow rings a bell, it's just, you know, a, 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 an iterative process for computing the fixed point of a nonlinear equation. So it turns out that because of some properties of these equations, just this iterative process is, is convergent to the fixed point. Again, I don't want to enter too much into the theory of, of these things because it would take me uh, too much time to, to cover, but uh, it's, it's just you know, maybe to throw some, some pointers that possible might ring about to, to some people. Okay, so the, this, this uh, algorithm here, we stop it, so we have to define a stopping condition, and we will say that we will stop when the uh, function itself doesn't change too much. Because this notation here is an L infinity norm, so it's the largest deviation between QK plus one and QK. And whenever it falls below a certain you know, tolerance uh, or, or accuracy level, desired accuracy level epsilon, we just stop. And the algorithm, of course, what we care about from, from you know, moment zero is policies. And so what we will call uh, so what this algorithm produces is a policy which is obtained as the greedy policy of the uh, uh, last action value function that has been returned. 
So intuitively, basically what I'm saying, and then there is a more formal statement, is that when iterations, when I keep repeating iterations, this Q value will tend to this. I know that pi star is greedy with respect to Q star. And so what I do is that, well, I hope that the pi k, which is greedy with respect to QK, since this tends to this, Hopefully, this will tend to this, right? That's the reasoning somehow of, of this whole scheme. Now, a little bit more formally, uh, so this algorithm, which is called value iteration, because we iterate over value functions, in this case, action value functions, uh, we say that, you know, starting from an arbitrary action value function, the sequence of functions generated by value iteration converges to Q star, and we can also characterize if you require a, an accuracy epsilon, we know that you will be stopping after at most this many iterations. So here, I, you know, I don't want to enter too much into the details, but basically, the, uh, uh, fortunately for us, the, the convergence is, is, uh, uh, is linear in an optimization language. Uh, which means that we need also logarithmic amount of uh, iterations with respect to the accuracy uh, epsilon. So this is, you know, roughly, you can rewrite it as log one over epsilon over one minus gamma. It's kind of similar to that, times R max. R max is, is just, you know, the largest reward that we can observe because it's just a scaling factor. Uh, the largest the reward, the more iterations that I, I need to, to converge. So it means that the convergence is fast. Uh, and so after at most these iterations, I will be stopping with something which is indeed epsilon close to the action value function. The last ingredient that we need to have is that, okay, but this is good news. It's convergent, converges fast, and it gives me an, a desired accuracy in terms of Q value. But what about the guy that we return? It is, is eventually the function that we return good or not? And this is complemented in this result, which says, if I stop it after k iterations and I have a certain qk, and I return as a policy, the policy which is greedy with respect to this, then I have this guarantee. And, and I would really like to spend one minute to read through it uh, uh, carefully. So we have an algorithm we don't care what it does. At, this, at the end, it says, oh, in my opinion, a very good policy is pi k. Okay, how do I evaluate, uh, theoretically speaking, whether pi k is good or not? Well, I say there is an optimal thing that I could do. You suggest a policy pi k, and it has a certain value, and I will compare how well you know, how much reward I can obtain by executing the policy that my algorithm return, and how much reward I would be getting by executing pi star in different states. Let's say that I want to be very conservative. I will judge my algorithm on the largest of these deviations. Actually, the absolute value is not even needed because, I mean, this is always bigger than this by definition. So let's just put a parenthesis. Uh, no, the, the cool stuff here is that the somehow performance loss that I can have by stopping after k iterations, when I reached, I computed this action value function, is upper bounded by this term. Okay, but this term I know a lot of things because this is actually exactly what I know that from the previous slide that if I run for k iterations this many, then I know that my q function is close to q star by at most epsilon. So I can carefully tune k epsilon in such a way that this is indeed equal to epsilon. So I can directly control my performance loss by choosing epsilon. So this is the cool part of the story. The less cool part of the story is that this epsilon will be indeed amplified by this number here. Why do I say that it's amplified? Well, look at the denominator here. Gamma is strictly smaller than one. 
And so this is always you know, smaller than one. One over this, it means that it's bigger than one. And so this is always somehow bigger than one, which means that, you know, if I stop after reaching an accuracy in this sense of epsilon, my performance might be bigger than epsilon loss. So I might suffer bigger than epsilon loss by how much? By a factor which depends on the discount factor. And this is very insightful somehow. So what he's saying is the following. Remember what was the interpretation of gamma. Gamma small means I care about recent rewards. Gamma large, so close to one, it means that I have, you know, I'm farsighted. So, I'm, I'm, so this one you can call it myopic, and, uh, and this one farsighted. So if gamma is large, which means it approaches one, then this constant becomes larger and larger. So why that? Well, because indeed the problem is more difficult. You're asking me to optimize my policy in the light of its behavior as spanned over a long horizon. So the longer the horizon that you ask, to, you ask me to optimize, the more difficult somehow the problem. It seems kind of unavoidable. It's, it's a burden that I have to carry about the fact that you're asking me to solve a very difficult optimization problem. Conversely, if gamma is very small, you know, close to zero, then I have a much easier problem. It means I just have to maximize the immediate reward, and I don't even have to care about the dynamics of the NDP. Whenever I'm in a state, I look what are the possible actions, and I take the action which maximizes the immediate reward. So there's no plan ahead. There's no sophisticated strategy to put in place. So this is just to mention that somehow the fact that this grows with, with gamma approaching one, it's kind of uh, expected and intuitive in, in, in some sense. Uh, so I will totally, uh, so I, you know, in uh, the burst of optimism, I, I put also the proof of this. I, I will you know, totally skip it. Um, just want to point out what is the, you know, the complexity of this problem and also to why somehow and later we will move to approximated algorithms. It's true that at each iteration we have to solve, you know, just compute, sorry, this, this, this thing, which means that we have for each state in each action to do this loop over states. So globally, each iteration costs S squared A. And at the end, we have just to compute this one, which means for each state, we have to compute an argmax over actions, which is uh, our complexity SA. So globally, basically, we have K times uh, K number of iterations S squared A, and if you want plus, of SA at the end to return the final policy. Then there is the space complexity of the problem, which is I have to store this whole thing, which is S, S, A object, so it's S squared A, and I have to store this function here, which is S, A function, and finally I have to store this action value function, which is an S, A object, and the not optimal, but let's say the policy that I return at the end, the greedy policy, which is just a vector of sciences. So this is a problem. You can clearly see that it's not scalable, right? When S becomes very large, I cannot expect to be able to uh, you know, even do S squared. It's, if I have a million states, S squared is, is definitely out of reach. Uh, and uh, if I have a continuous problem where I have an infinite number of states, then this is even less sensible. So this, let's take it as a sort of proof of the fact that we can solve MDPs, we can leverage Bellman equations, but later on we will have to do some approximations to make it uh, scale beyond you know, a, a handful of hundreds of thousands of states, let's say. Is there any question on this? Uh, then we will pass through policy iteration and I will show an example of how these algorithms work in practice so as to kind of fix a little bit ideas. Been you know going a little bit quick, so you know happy to pause a second uh, here if there is any question, either from the room or in the chat.
Yeah, so there is a question on the chat, uh, Jeremy asks, uh, 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 how, do, how did we know P? We know it, right? I mean, it's, it's an assumption. It's a strong assumption. Uh, I can tell you how, how you know, historically the NAMI programming works. Uh, it's, you know, it has a lot of connection between statistics and control theory. Uh, and typically the answer is, well, of course you don't know it, but you, know, you estimate it from data and then you have it and you apply it. So uh, the oftentimes the, the approach, you can take it you know, from mathematical finance to optimal control to a lot of other, other fields, is we define families of P functions because we know a lot about the problem. I don't know if you're familiar with control theory, it might be you know, LQR type of models or you know, other things that I find particularly convenient and particularly informed by my knowledge of the problem. Uh, but then, yeah, there are some parameters that are known. Let me just give an example. So we, uh, you know, we looked at this at this problem here, and we said that at the end, what really mattered was the distribution from which this uh, demand was was coming from, right? And once I knew this, then the dynamics was simple because it was just st plus at minus dt uh, around it. Plus, so I know the you know the, the the functional form of the transition is known, but I don't know the exact distribution of this guy. Of course, what I'm doing here is a modeling assumption, but you know I I assume that it's modeled this way, and I assume that this is maybe a uniform distribution between A and B, but A and B are unknown. So if I knew them, I would run value iteration up front. If I don't know them, which is typically the case, you can always say, you know, I try to estimate them from data, data that I historically collected. I plug them into my functional form of their transition model, which is this one. And then I just run value iteration and I will get the optimal policy. Okay, right. Any other question on the chat or in the room? Okay, so let's move to the second algorithm. So as I mentioned before, uh, full reinforcement learning and dynamic programming as well, uh, it's always about these two point of view. So here we take a point of view which is a little bit weird in the sense that we work on functions exploiting the notion of optimal Bellman equation to derive a policy. But there is also another approach, which is more direct in some sense. It's the policy iteration algorithm, which says, no, well, let's compute directly a policy. And the algorithm works like this. It says, start with the policy, I0, arbitrary, doesn't really matter which one. And then it goes through iterations as well. And each iteration is, is split in two steps. The first one is usually called policy evaluation uh, step. And it means that given a policy, I want to compute how good that policy is. So it's purely evaluation. I just want to assess the quality of that policy. And then second step is the policy improvement, which says I had the policy, I know how well it performed, and there is a very, very neat trick to compute directly from this information a new policy, pi k plus one, which for sure it will be better or at least not worse than the previous one. And the very neat uh, argument is just this one. So this I could rewrite it as the policy which is greedy with respect to v pi k. So we come back to this notion of greedy policies with respect to a value function. And again, intuitively, basically, it's, it's similar to uh, you know, the reasoning that I had, I had here. So let me just redo it for, for a second. I'm in this state. My current policy, pi k, prescribes to go to this state. And then you know, I have a sequence of, of actions uh, as prescribed by policy. 
let's say then I have another state where I have another uh, execution, and this I will call it V pi k of say S1, and this is V pi k of S1 prime. Okay. Now imagine that there exists, and 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 let's assume that V pi k S1 is smaller than V pi k S1 prime. So if I knew this and I ask you which state you would like to start from, you would say, well, if I can, I prefer to start from S1 prime rather than S1. But then if I slightly change the question and I say, oh, imagine that you have an alternative action, which is not the one prescribed by pi, let's call it just A, which instead of taking you to S1, it takes you to S1 prime. Then which action would you take in S in, in S0? Well, I would take A. I would not take pi k because I know that I can get to a state which is better off than the state that pi k pi, pi k would would get. And once I reach this, well, I still follow the old policy and, and it's fine. Now, intuitively, now I did a little bit of improvement of my previous policy, right? So I change it just one little thing, which is the action that I take here. But at least in this state, by changing the policy from this one to the policy that takes action A, I'm now better off because I achieve a better state. Of course, what is missing in the reasoning is also the reward that I'm taking along the way. But let's say that they are the same. So yeah, the discriminant is not really about the reward. It's really about the state that I reach. So basically what I'm saying here is exactly the same. In a state S, I will define my new policy as the one which takes the action which maximizes the immediate plus future reward as if from any state Y that I reach, I will just keep executing the old policy by K. Intuitively, this one now is a better policy than the previous one. And so that's the reason why we call it policy improvement. And if we keep running these over iterations, policy evaluation, policy improvement, then the value of our policies pi one will be uh, uh, better than pi zero, pi two will be better than pi one, and pi three, pi two, and so on and so forth. Actually, the result that we have is even stronger in the sense that we know that the process is indeed convergent and it will not get stuck in you know, just local minima. So somehow if it happens that at a certain point I have a policy pi k whose value is equal to v pi k minus one in all states, then pi k is pi star. Otherwise, it means that I will be improving over it. So basically, if I learn a policy, if I compute a policy through this, which does not really do anything, in the sense that it's you know, not moving the value, then it means I've already reached the top. So it's really monotonically improving until I plateau to the best thing that any way I can do. So this is a little bit captured by this proposition. It's a little bit informal the way I write it here, but it's a little bit what I wrote at the top of the previous uh, the previous slide, which means that the process is monotonically non-decreasing in value, but indeed I can still prove that it converges to uh, the largest possible value in a finite number of iterations. So I'm no longer talking about asymptotic convergence. Now I'm really telling you that I take that huge combinatorial space of policies and I navigate through it and in a finite number of iterations, which turns out to be just polynomial in S and A, and I will not give much more characterization, uh, in a finite number of iterations, which is just polynomial, and the polynomial is, a, I think it's an order two here, an order one here. Uh, is able to kind of navigate through this combinatorial space and do converge to the optimal policy. So it's a very powerful algorithm in this sense. Now, what are the bad news about this? Well, it's on the complexity. So if you look at the, this step here, we have to 
compute the value function. And the computation of the value function is, if you remember, it's you know, solving that uh, uh, linear system of equations that we mentioned before, which requires inverting this matrix, and this might take up to us to a cube. So previously, if you remember, the complexity of, of uh, value iteration was S squared A per iteration. Now we have a complexity which is S cubed which might again be you know, not very desire, desirable. On the other hand, the policy improvement step is, is you know, relatively cheaper because it's just a order of SA. Additionally, if I was to do, instead of value function, action value functions, then the greedy step can be do even more uh, efficiently because in each state, I only have to compute this uh, um, uh, this maximum here, so it's, it's it's a little bit cheaper. So overall, this uh, this algorithm converges much faster, possibly than value iteration, but each iteration is computationally more expensive. So that's usually the the way to to think about the comparison of this. So uh, while I, I I set up an example that I want to show you. Uh, you know, let me know if there is uh, any question on the second algorithm. And uh, meanwhile, I will jump an example. Hopefully, this one should work. All right, let me let me just execute very quick. So I. <clears throat> So I put the, the, the link to this to this tool that you can download and, and, and use. We will not do any really an exercise on this, but you know it's just for for illustrating a little bit uh, things, and we'll be using it also to illustrate a little bit of Q learning. Um, so imagine that you have this navigation problem. So you have a, a maze, a labyrinth, uh, where there is a goal state which is here, and there is a bunch of walls around and uh, the reward function or in this case let's say more properly the cost function is uh, of uh, unit one at each step so you know to incentivate the agent to reach the goal as fast as possible i will say that you know every time you take yet another action it has a cost of one and uh, uh, to make it also more sensitive to uh, to the walls, I say that every time you take an action that bumps against the wall, you get a penalty of 50, so a huge, a huge penalty. Uh, additionally, the environment is stochastic. So for instance, in, if I'm in this state here and I take, I don't know, action right, with probability 0 0.7, I do have a transition to the right. With probability 0 0.3, I have a random outcome which can be either go up or go left or go down with equal probability. So a sort of failure of, of my action, let's say. So this is, you know, doesn't have to be very uh, very realistic, but you know, just to make the problem a little bit complicated. Uh, so in this case, we will assume that we know all these things. So we know where the goal is, uh, we know where the wall is, we know the dynamics, we know this 0 0.7, 0 0.3, and uh, we just try to compute the optimal policy through value iteration. Okay, so we initialize to a value function. So I will try to keep, I'll go ahead and uh, keep this, uh, this slide maybe on your screens. Uh, to try to follow up what I'm uh, going to illustrate now. Um, and uh, we initialize the action value function or the value function. So actually, this is a, a simpler version of the algorithm, but doesn't matter. Uh, so we initialize it to zero everywhere. So these little zeros that you see here is, is the value that we initialize at. And the uh, uh, little thin uh, line here is if we stopped at this iteration and we sorry and we return uh, this policy here this policy 
see here what it would look like. Okay, so at iteration was well, zero, all the values are zero. So by default, I take an action which is up. I could take any other action because basically, you know, the arg max of this is anything, right? I mean, it's all zero, so they all maximize. Okay, so let's try to do one step. So one iteration of this, which means that for all state and actions, we will be updating the action value function this way. And then we will also be visualizing not only the value that I get, but also the policy associated to it. So we do one step. Now again, uh, it's a slightly it's a small variant of the algorithm that I, that I mentioned. And the numbers that you have here are are minus the reward in some sense. So here, since we are talking about costs, the larger the value, the worse, right? Because it means uh, I, I, that state has a, from that state, I expect to get larger cost. So I, I will look for lighter colors, which are better states somehow. So I've done just one iteration and, you know, for instance, uh, sorry, maybe let me just, Re, just because the walls front end that we cannot see them that well after that. So let's just keep in mind that there is a wall here, right? Uh, and then I do one step and, and here's where the goal is. So you see that I have very, very dark color here, right? So this is expected because basically from here, whatever action I do actually, I have some chance to bump into a wall either because I directly go into the wall or because of randomness. And what we said before is that every time I hit the wall, I get a very large penalty. So these are very, you know, undesirable states. And all I've done here is just one iteration of this. So, you know, this is still possibly very, very far from Q star. It's just Q1. But, you know, I still learned something. I, I still capturing something about the environment. So much so that you see that at least if I stop now, there are things that are sensible, like for instance here, you know, here there are walls. And so the action that I'm suggesting is to go right, definitely not to go against the walls and not to get a very large uh, penalty right away. So let's just, you know, go a little bit through, uh, through iterations and see what happens. So uh, the colors become darker and darker. And this is kind of intuitive because the more I loop through this, at the beginning, this was zero. So what Q1 really was, was just the reward. But then, and, and you know, again, the negative reward, if you want. And, but then, you know, this will be the reward in the iteration two, which I, you know, sum up to the reward. So I have, you know, twice rewards. And so this becomes larger, larger and larger, but the policy associated to it, it also becomes much more sensitive. And so if you now start looking at the thin uh, uh, white lines, you see that we start directing a little bit the policy towards, uh, towards the goal. So you see that here I go up, here I go down, and you start seeing a sort of flowing directions towards, uh, towards the goal. Just out of curiosity, let me, let me point out you know, tricky states like this. So you could say that from the point of view of you know, just reaching the goal, going down or going right should be equivalent, right? In the sense, you know, they just get one step closer to the goal. But here, don't forget that there is randomness in the way the outcome of the action plays out, which means that if I go right, there is some probability that I bump into this wall. Uh, and, and the same if I go down. But if I go right, there is some probability that I bump into the wall. And then even if I succeed, I end up in a state which also has you know, a probability to bump into the wall. On the other hand, if I go down and I'm successful, I go to this state, which on the other hand, even on, on very unfortunate realizations, cannot bump into a wall. So somehow this state is better off than this one. You see that this one has a negative cost, uh, negative reward of 21, this one is a negative reward of 16, so this is preferable. And so you see that navigating in the middle between the walls is better than, you know, just trying my luck in uh, going adjacent to, to the walls. 
And so again, I can you know, keep looping over iterations. You see that the numbers move. By the way, these numbers are run between the year. So that's the reason why we don't see much variations. But you know, we can you know, just iterate through, uh, through steps. And eventually, after 61 iterations, with the uh, let's say, precision required to this algorithm, it stops and it returns uh, a policy which just intuitively, if we look into it, it really looks like the good one, right? In the sense, for instance, if I start here, we would just try to go through this corridor. And if it happens that it deviates and it goes up, it will immediately try to shift back down. And the same when I'm here, if I happen to shift in the lower row, then I will try to go up again to go back to this sort of safer highway in the middle. And the same for you know all these other things. So for instance, you notice that here, this state, so these are two walls. I prefer to actually go left than going up, because again, if I go left, I can escape walls better than I if I go if I go up here because then there are you know the walls that I have up here. So you know you can try to read a little bit through this and uh, and try to you know interpret this, but this is just to, sh to show that after 61 iterations and co computationally after 16 milliseconds uh, the algorithm did converge to something which really looks like it's a good it's a good policy. Now, just for the sake of comparison, let's just look at what happens when I do uh, uh, policy iteration. So in this case, uh, what we initialize with, now we should read this differently in the sense that what we initialize is the policy. And let's initialize this to always go up because anyway, we have no prior knowledge about the problem. And now what you will be seeing in terms of values here is the value of the policy. So let's look back into the algorithm. What you will be seeing in terms of numbers is the value associated to that policy. Here I haven't run it yet. So you know the value at the beginning is zero because I haven't done any computation. Let's do one step. And wow, now it's super dark. And uh, wh why is the case, right? Why, why do we get all these huge numbers and these very dark uh, values. Well, let's let's just move back. So what we are evaluating is a policy, which in all states, it just keeps going up. And if from this state, I keep going up, with very large probability, I will just keep bumping into this wall over and over and over again, and I will just keep back getting a penalty of 50, 50, 50, 50 cumulatively, and so my value function in this state will be just you know, very, very large. Now, the reason why here you see 5,016 is just because you know, things are computed to finite precision. And so you know, it's, uh, uh, it's, I mean, there is also a bit of discount. So this kind of converged to a number. But you know, in principle, it's basically infinite. I just put an infinitely long time, I will just getting almost always 50. But now let's look at how the, the thin lines, they got updated. So what we are looking at now is the new policy that I improved over the previous one. And you can see that now, even with just one iteration, the policy already looks quite reasonable. In the sense that here I'm going down, here I'm going up. I hope that you, know, you can interpret this, you know, this is, you know, this, this, for instance, is going, uh, still going down, so this is not very precise. But you know, here I'm going down, here I'm going up, which means I, I hint to the goal at least. Then second iteration, the value of that policy, so now I'm looking at V of pi of the previous iteration, it's much, much better, which means that already that policy was already reasonable. And the policy improvement with respect to that, which are these new lines here, it almost looks quite perfect. Sense, you know, it, it's already converging intuitively towards the, the goal very well. So let's just run a bunch of few iterations. And after seven iterations, the algorithm stops. 
And in this case, it really stops because it found the optimal policy. So there's no approximation whatsoever going on here. This is really the optimal thing. And uh, the time it takes, unfortunately, it's much longer. So I have just seven iterations, many less, but you see that the total amount of time now is 54 versus the 16 before, which again, it means that value iteration up to a certain precision has many more iterations, but each of them is very fast. Value iteration, it does converge exactly after a finite number of iterations and very few in this case, but it, 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 each iteration is quite expensive. The ordering is not always the same, but this is you know, just to give a little bit of the dimensions of comparison uh, between the two algorithms. Okay, so uh, we have you know, 15 minutes uh, left to go, and I would like to you know, shift to the properly reinforcement learning uh, uh, part of the, of the course, if you want, but uh, you know, we'll just stop for a minute, see if there is any question. Um, because now basically we will be surprisingly going fast in deriving the algorithms, because as you will see, we will just mimic these algorithms using data and later on using approximation. So we will not be, it will also almost be a little bit disappointing how we will be deriving reinforcement learning algorithms at this point. It's a bit late during the day, so I, I realize this. It's quite heavy uh, part now. Yes, so we have one question. question. Um, could you go again a little bit to, uh, to the explanation of why PK uh, plus one is a better policy than PK on, on, the, yes. on this precise example? Thanks. Uh, on, you mean on, on, on this example or? Oh, in general, or, it's okay. Say, like, in general. okay. Yeah, so uh, uh, the intuition, and again, I can only provide intuition in the sense that I don't want to enter into the, the formal proof, which by the way, it's not that difficult, but it would have required me to introduce other things and so I prefer to, to skip it. The intuition is, is uh, imagine that all I'm doing is asking you this question here. So let me let me just revise a little bit the, the, the example here. So you start from a state as zero, uh, you take an action, which is the one prescribed by pi k, and deterministically, uh, you end up in a state as one uh, by obtaining a reward of r. And somebody told you, because you have done the policy evaluation step, that from this moment on, uh, the cumulative sum of rewards is basically this V pi K in S1. And you know it because you computed it. It's the policy evaluation step. Uh, now, what you do through this equation here is to ask you the question, okay, but in that S0, is there anything different that I could do? And is there anything better that I could do? And imagine that we are just really in this example, where all you can do is just to change the action that you take in this state. And imagine that there exists only one alternative action, which has exactly the same reward as the other one, but it ends up in a different state. So the only difference between executing pi k or action a is not in terms of rewards, but in, this terms, in, in terms of achieving a different state. And thanks to the fact that I've done the policy evaluation, I know that indeed this state is better off in the sense that it, uh, 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 if I execute pi k from there, I obtain a largest reward than if I started from S1. Then by basically uh, Bellman equations, I know that the policy that in S0 takes you know, A, and it's equal to pi k in all other states, it will have a value function in S0, which is r, 
plus gamma v by k because let's say that you know we can only go forward here in uh, s1 prime whereas previously the value function that i had here in a zero was getting the same reward the same discount but achieving a different a different state now since this one is bigger than this then this policy is better than this in this state maybe it's equal in all the other states because we didn't change anything but in this very state it's better so basically selecting pi k pi k plus one as the action that maximizes this which is what is prescribed sorry prescribed by by this is indeed improving over the previous policy. Again, uh, you know, it's a little bit hand wavy. I realize that there are, there are few more complex ingredients to, to take care of, but this is basically the intuition of why this is a better policy. And, uh, and so if there is something better that we can do, we will do it. If there is nothing, then it means that the policy that we were starting from was already optimal. Does it uh, clarify a little bit? Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, thanks. There is another, another question. question. I'm, not sure, uh, the... I'm not sure I understood um, the last thing you, say before the, you said before the questions. Did you mean that you don't need to compute um, using an um, optimization scheme or linear algebra or whatever the the policy, uh, the best policy and the best uh, value function? And, and did you did you mean that actually you you just need to to run the the Markov process on, uh, on to run the Markov process and 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 this is going to to go to the optimal value more or less uh, with uh, with some probability or whatever so i don't so, uh, i'm not sure uh, i'm clear do, do you do you see what i mean or? I, I, so I try to reply and then you tell me if, if somehow it addresses the, the question so i would say i'm not there yet in the sense that uh here i'm not simulating anything there is no sample i'm saying if i perfectly know p then I have an algorithm that computes. So I'm not using the word learning. I'm not using the word estimating. It's really computing uh, a sequence of functions in the case of value iteration or a sequence of policies in the case of policy iteration that do converge towards, let's say, the optimal policy. So by iterating the application, let's say, of the not of the process in a stochastic sense, in the sense of, you know, sampling something and, you know, I'm not sampling anything. Here I'm really taking P as an operator somehow, so much that, you know, we're talking about Bellman operators as well. So by just keep applying the same thing, I end up solving this system of nonlinear equations. So you can purely think about it as an optimization problem where I get a non-system, non-linear non system of equations, which do admit, does admit a fixed point, so that means a solution, and I solve it by iterative algorithms. That's all I'm, I'm saying. And okay, so it turns out that this system of equations has nice properties, and so iterating this thing do converge because of contraction and so on and so forth. And similarly on the policy, it can also be seen as a sort of, you know, attempt of solving the optimization problem, but on a, somehow on a dual that, uh, um, that also has the properties of somehow contracting and so converging to the, to the optimal policy. But here, somehow only computation. We are not doing any actual simulation, let's say, of the process. Does it kind of address the okay. question? Thank yes, thank you very much. Yeah, thanks. So there is also a question on the chat, uh, a really small question. In the example, why are the values in the left top and bottom corners not the same? So, so in the left top and bottom. So I guess that you're referring to this one and this one, right? So, well, I guess that uh, it's because uh, it's, it's, the goal is not centered. 
So you know you have your your five steps to this to this to the top and four steps to the bottom. So you're better off if you start from here. Oh, you probably you mentioned this one. Then. 37 and 38. I think this might be just 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 be around me. Uh, but no, again, you know this. Uh, ah, okay, yeah. No, this this. Uh, yeah, this might be subtle, and 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 okay, this is funny. Uh, so I don't know if this was the exact question, but okay, let me let me just you know spend a second on this. It's a little bit funny. Uh, so let's look at you know this, uh, what happens starting from here. So if I go down straight, this is a bad idea because again I I go over states that have walls close by, and so you see that you know right away I kind of shift to the left to try to stay a little bit in the middle. But now let's look at what happens here. So if I shift on the left, which says the same rationale, actually end up here, that with some probability, even if I go up, end up here, which is a very nasty state because you know, it has two walls. Well, this one, even if, I, if, even if going down, it's a failure. Well, I end up here, which is a state which is also very nice because it doesn't have any wall in the middle. So, so how, you know, this, starting from here, it might be more dangerous in some sense than starting from here because of this effect of stochasticity and walls that is, is specific of this problem. So this is just to you know, reinforce also the fact that if you had to solve this problem by, let's say, intuition, you might not get it right. Because if I have to integrate in my mind what is the residual probability of failures that I can have over and over of transition into states that then have some probability of transition into states that might hit a wall? And I have to integrate all these possible scenarios and integrate them in taking the right decision. Is it better to go down or left? It's super hard because I have to really think about, you know, very long in the future and very stochastic events where, you know, we know that as humans, we can plan ahead five steps after five steps in a stochastic environment. Well, who knows, right? I mean, if you tell me what is the optimal action that I should be doing now for optimizing my life in, in 10 years from now, I just give up, right? And say, who, who knows, right? I mean, there's so many uncertainty of which the probability I, know, I don't know, but even if I knew, or I could estimate it accurately, I would not have the computational power to integrate all these informations. Well, thanks to Bellman equations and, and, uh, and the value or policy iteration, we can do it uh, uh, in these cases where we know P. And again, we will see how to do it uh, in the general case. Okay, so we're you know two minutes to the to the end. So let me you know just wrap up. I I, I think it's not worth it to start the the next lecture. Uh, so I will just you know wrap up and, and tease let's say the the next uh, the, the things that we will be seeing tomorrow. So uh, wrapping up basically what we've seen today, which was you know, fast uh, uh, dive into RL is is few ingredients. The Markov decision process, so how an agent interacts with an environment, and all the assumptions that are uh, implicit into this, choosing this way of modeling things, stationarity, Markov assumption, the fact that the problem can be captured by just you know, maximizing instantaneous rewards, uh, then we have seen uh, how to formalize the concept of the uh, of a policy, and we kept it easy, just a mapping between states and actions. And then we have seen how to evaluate the quality of the policy through the a value function first, an action value function later, as the cumulative sum of discounted rewards on average with respect to the random transitions that possibly happen in the environment. And, uh, and this was you know, just about formalizing the problem. And then the second part of this afternoon, we have seen how fortunately all these ingredients they satisfy nice structural properties like the Bellman equation for policies or the uh, Bellman equation for optimal 
uh, value functions. And this was the basic ingredient on which we kind of build the algorithms like value iteration and, uh, and, and policy iteration, the second one, which heavily relies on these notions of the fact that the value function here is related to the value function in the next state, either for a fixed policy or for uh, the optimal uh, policy as well. What we're going to uh, see uh, tomorrow is, is basically how uh, these, um, these two algorithms, value iteration and, and policy iteration, can be turned into reinforcement learning algorithms. And from this moment on, we will be considering this type of scenario where we have an agent, we observe an initial state, we take an action, we observe a next state, a reward associated to that, and we just keep going, right? So from, uh, uh, let's say, minute one of, the, of tomorrow, we will just be considering an agent interacting with the environment, and all we know about the environment is what we observe while we, uh, we interact with it. So just to maybe a very, very quick tease uh, uh, of, uh, of what we are going to see tomorrow are going to be, you know, things like these. Uh, sorry. We have an agent down here, this is the smiley face, and the agent will have to learn by doing things. I move up, I see that my state moved from this one to this one, I observe a certain reward associated to it, and that's all I know. Maybe my transition was stochastic, maybe my reward was stochastic, and I don't even know where the goal is, and I have to learn by continuous interaction with the environment how to actually get to the goal as, as fast as possible. And what we will be seeing is something like this. You know, an agent that moves around, tries things uh, here and there. Sometimes it goes well, sometimes it goes uh, yeah, less uh, well. And eventually, after a lot of episodes, so you see this guy now is trying stuff uh, here and there. Uh, let me just you know, run a couple more of episodes. Uh, and then we can you know, just stop it there and see what we learned. And you know, we might have learned something decent. In this case, it's still not that great. Let me just run maybe a couple of more of, uh, of episodes. Okay. And now you see that I have something that might not be, strictly speaking, the optimal policy because I haven't converged to it yet. And now I use converge in a learning sense. So in the sense that I have not collected enough samples to give you a good optimal policy. But when we look at it, so again, remember that here there is a wall, here there is a wall, and I think here there is a wall as well. This. So you see that you know I go right, then I go up, and then I go down, then I go right. And you know, it's still not that great. Here I haven't, yeah, let me just learn a little bit more, sorry. Okay, so you know I go towards the goal, but still in a very uncertain way. So if I keep uh, running a bunch of more episodes, hopefully we will be going towards something which is well, more stable and also more sensible. Yeah. Just, and remember that all of this is very stochastic here. So you know I have to integrate this stochasticity into my learning process, which is very tricky job to do. Maybe I should rewind it with a little less of, sorry. Let me just um, stop. <laughs> okay, this is the problem. So this is the moment when usually you have headlines on the, on the newspaper saying, oh, you know, uh, in the artificial intelligence lab, they started running an agent and they lost control about it. So, okay, now I, I, I reduced a lot the stochasticity of the environment, so it should be converging much faster to something decent. Well, let's wait a couple of variations. And let's look at it a little bit. So going up, right, 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 down. So, or going right, 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 right. So yeah, this looks already you know, a little bit more solid policy than the ones that we had before. Again, keep in mind that, you know, we really need to escape walls which are bad. So, you know, there are things like, you know, for instance, 
moving back to the left is really to avoid this wall, which might not be the optimal policy, but it's at least something reasonable. So we will be seeing, you know, a little bit how to get this type of algorithms run and converge, and we will be actually implementing it and, um, and, and try to see how to parameterize uh, it in order to make it work. And then eventually we will also move to more complicated realizations of these algorithms and also integrate a little bit of deep learning uh, into it. So this is the, the, the menu for tomorrow. Thanks a lot for, for your time. Take your rest. Uh, and uh, I will see you tomorrow. And I'm around for a few more minutes if you have questions, of course. Okay, thank you very much, Alessandro. Thank you. Thank you.